while he was flipping and stuff, he was licking the feet of so. Oh, what a good guy. And he, he has to take a lot. We're, we're basically on the mind. Probably 95% of the mind. And then this is not preventative. Preventative. It's basically preventative, yeah, at this point. You know, we're hoping to keep him alive for a while. Because he's 12 years old. I have never had a skin dog like that. Never had a skin dog. And he's just phenomenal. And he doesn't shed. Uh, I feel like I don't know how to get So they don't have any kind of a body or anything. Um, so that's not good. But he's very hungry. No, that's the same. My wife spends all day. Yeah. All right, well, we're not ready yet. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone here. And uh, we have, I'm sure, some people watching on Facebook. And later they'll be uh, viewing on YouTube. And we'll be delivering this on the radio. So we welcome everyone, regardless of where they are. I'll start off with a few announcements. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, remind everybody that Pastor Bob is, uh, this is his last day off. Uh, so we want to pray that he and, and his wife, Pastor Karen, are doing well. Um, we'd also like to thank um, uh, Pastor Matt Judd from Glenwood for covering 
uh, for any, any needs, pastoral needs, the last uh, couple of weeks. And uh, if you do have a pastoral need before tomorrow when Pastor Bob returns, you can reach out to him. Uh, we have a couple of announcements that you'll find in, in your bulletin. Uh, it's been a few weeks, I think, since we talked about it, but the Parsonage Basement um, Repair, we're still looking at, at that $13,000 estimate, so if you would like to contribute towards that, that would be very helpful because uh, it was an unplanned cost. Um, there is also a uh, Gannon United Pantry Food Drive that we are going to support. So this is a uh, food pantry uh, specifically for college students. Uh, many of them have meal plans and access to the cafeteria and, and, and all that, but not everyone. So this uh, food pantry drive will uh, be serving those folks. Um, some other announcements. Next week is going to be a special uh, Sunday with a special offering for the United Methodist Church's Human Relations Day. So that's uh, advance notice on that. And then we also have a, uh, a letter here from the Lawrence Park United Methodist Church on Saturday, January 21st in the evening. They are having a uh, game dinner. So uh, they would like RSVPs by Monday the 16th. And I have contact information up here. Um, I'll keep this handy with me. So if you'd like to participate in that, I can pass it along to you. So this is a game dinner. Uh, for, for men of the church, and um, there's just a free will offering for that. Uh, I think Ma uh, Natalie has a few announcements that she'd like to share with us. Hello, good morning. It's nice to see faces on this side rather than backs of heads at the back of the church, so good to see all of you. This is just a couple of quick, and uh, tell me if I'm too loud, this is a new mic, so it, I, we can talk really soft now. Um, from financial side of things, if you did receive a pledge card, we sent these out with a Thanksgiving letter um, and offering envelope. Um, there is a pledge card that you can pledge for 2023. If you did receive one of these, and if not turned it in, we just ask you to get that into us. You can put it in the offering plate, mail it in, get, uh, bring it by the office. And it's nice because you can break down, is it a weekly giving, is it a monthly, a yearly? And then if you want it to go towards certain things, um, we can break it down that way. If you did not get one of these, just see me. I can make sure you get one. Also, giving statements. If you gave last year and 2022, I can't believe you're already saying that. If you gave last year and need a giving statement, um, they are not sent out automatically because not everybody wants them. And so we'd rather be good stewards of your funds and send them out to people who actually uh, would like to have them. Just contact Melody, our financial administrator. Her information's on the back of the bulletin and we can make sure to get that to you. If you're not getting our mailings, whether through the mail, um, we do three mass mailings a year generally, and then also send out uh, each week with the bulletin, we send it electronically with any inserts that we have at the time. If you, don't, if you aren't getting things through the mail, because we do get some kickbacks, maybe we don't have your right address, maybe we don't have it, or maybe we don't have your email address um, that you want this information coming, just see me and I'll make sure that you get added and then you can uh, see where your heart leads for you know, what information touches you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Yep. I think that just about does it for announcements. The, uh, the altar flowers here are offered up by Bob and Cindy uh, in memory of Bob's mother, Catherine Reed. Um, does anybody out there have any announcements? Yes, Carol. Our church secretary, not everybody might know that. Oh, yeah. If, if you don't know Natalie, she uh, warms our office with cheer <laughs> on Mondays through Thursdays. She, she does so much uh, work for us, and uh, we, are, we are so grateful for Natalie. Yes, thank you, Carol. <laughs> Any other announcements? All right, well then let us... Let us prepare to worship the Lord this morning.
Again, good morning, and this morning I get to play liturgist too. So, again, welcome to all of you here in the sanctuary worshiping with us today. And again, if you are listening later on the radio, WERG 90.5, and also out on the World Wide Web, we welcome you. Now, if you are able, please stand, and we will join together in today's call to worship, found on page two of your bulletin. On this day, we remember the gift of God's Word, who gathers us together from the farthest parts of the world to worship in joy and hope. On this day, we remember the simple graces of the bread and the cup, those plain gifts, shaped by God's love into nourishing hope. On this day, we remember the gifts of water and oil, cleansing us in the baptismal pools, anointing us as God's children. And now, our opening hymn, found in your black hymnal, baptized in water, number 2248, and we will sing all three verses.
be seated. We will now join together in the prayer of the day. You could let us continue to shuffle through the world's deserts, God of Christmas, but you chose to walk with us beside the rivers of life. You could forget who we are, but you adopt us into your family, your children of hope and joy. You could decide we are not worth all the love or all the agony of caring, but you redeem us and make us whole. Blessed are you. In the name of Christ, we rejoice. Amen. So I have a question. Who here has seen uh, 
been to, been to the peninsula and seen a boat out on the water. Got one. I've seen boats. Have you seen a boat out on the water? All right. How about airplanes in the sky? You ever see one of those? Yeah? Yeah, there's people going out and about, doing things, going places. How do you think they know where to go when they're out on the lake, on the ocean, or up in the sky? How do they know? Their controls. Yeah. Yeah, they control. Somebody at the first service said radar. Have you ever heard of radar? Or a map? That's how they know where to go. It's lucky they know where to go. Sometimes we don't know where to go, right? Yeah. Yeah. So maps help us know where to go, and sometimes we have to check. Because even if you know where to go, if you, if you close your eyes and you start walking around, are you going to get where you think you need to be? You're going to end up tripping, right? Walking into a wall or a door or something. Yeah. So when we need to know where to go, we need to be looking around and making sure we're headed in the right direction. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit in church today is keeping our eye fixed on God and thinking about where we're headed. So let's say a prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you lead us and how we can search where we are right now and figure out where we need to be and that you and to be confident that you will guide us. We thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. Don't close your eyes on the way back.
words of that hymn say it pretty well. <clears throat> Recreate us, God transform. Let's continue in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning seeking your reassurance, your comfort, your grace. We gather today among fellow believers to worship you. We thank you for all the blessings you have showered upon us, the people you have brought into our lives, the richness of this world, and the abundance of your love and provision for us. You've given us so much that it can be overwhelming. And yet, we become distracted with worry and fear. We endure pain and sometimes we inflict it. Help us to be the people of your church, delivering hope, sharing the gospel, loving one another and the world around us, just as Christ showed us by example. We submit to you all of our ups and downs, the joys, the troubles, we submit ourselves just as we are to you. Please let your Holy Spirit descend upon each one of us completely. Let your spirit saturate us for healing, for comfort, and for leading. We give you all that we are. Help strengthen us along the way, for we cannot do it alone. As we think of our brothers and our sisters in Christ, we pray specifically for those laid on our hearts this morning. Danielle asks for prayers for her friend Laura, that you could be healing in her life. Louise Stewart asks for prayers that her, her treatment upcoming is successful. Pray that you would be healing her and with those who will work in their ministry of healing. Andrew Clausen prays that God will lead him, show him the best way. We pray for Kathy Kensel. We're grateful she is here. We pray that you will just continue to be with her as she needs your healing presence. We pray for many who need healing, Lord. We pray for Valerie Radke and Ida Sweet. We pray for Flo and Cheryl. We pray for Joyce and Mary Jane and Marilyn Beauchall, and undoubtedly many others who are on our minds right now. We pray for all those who are ill and those who treat the diseases. Be with them as they provide care. We pray for a world in turbulence, those standing for freedom, particularly around the world. Governments seem to be persecuting those they should serve. We pray for war-torn Eastern Europe. We pray for those desiring war to see wisdom elsewhere. We pray for those in battle that they can have mercy and find mercy. We pray for people who find themselves as political prisoners. We pray for the refugees searching for life and hope and instead being preyed upon from every angle. We pray for our local church. We pray for our pastor and his wife Karen as they take time to Sabbath. We pray for our denomination, for churches everywhere, Lord for our Christian brothers and sisters sharing the gospel, some under persecution. Lord, we offer up all of these prayers to you, as well as many unspoken prayers among us. Be with each one of us here gathered today. May your spirit dwell in each of us and rest upon all those we love. In particular, we pray for those who seek for you. May we and our fellow Christian brothers and sisters have the privilege of helping them find their way to you, Lord. We pray always to you, Father, Holy Spirit, and Blessed Son.
thank you for the words that Jesus shared, the words that Jesus taught us, that we pray together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this is the Sunday of the year that we remember Christ's baptism. The way the calendar falls, we have a short window of time between Christmas and Easter to jam all of Christ's ministry into a few months. And so we hit things off quickly here in January, remembering the baptism of our Lord. I'm going to share with you the, uh, actually the entirety of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. And uh, let's, let's dive into the scripture. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John wore a garment of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. He went out, people went out from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region about the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by John in the Jordan River. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his place of baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit, then, in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness in this way. And then John permitted him. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and suddenly the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So what is baptism? The Greek word used in the Gospels is baptisma, which means to submerge or to dip or to immerse something in, in water. And in the, its original use was about 500 years before Christ, and it was actually in uh, dyes. They would you know, put some gray or white cloth into a dye, and it would emerge crimson or, or blue. It had a connotation of a changing of identity. And at this time of year, when we examine Jesus' baptism, we're often driven to recall our own baptism. Now, for some of us, myself included, I was baptized by an infant. I don't remember it, not a bit. Others were baptized as children. Perhaps they have a, a distant memory, and some have made adult baptism decisions. But regardless of when it happened, we can all imagine a time of being physically cleansed. We've all probably had a time where we needed physically cleansed. We can also imagine times where we've needed spiritual cleansing. But if we think about immersion and a changing of identity, this helps us understand a little bit more of what was going on and what John was up to in the desert. 
This was more than John engaging in some Jewish bath ritual. Uh, this, was a clean, this was more than just a cleansing. John was innovating a bit. He was calling people to immerse themselves and to repent, which we, we might remember means to turn away. So for them, it was a public acknowledgement, a profession, that something in them needed to change, and they needed to emerge from that water as a different person. Imagine somebody walking up to the banks of the Jordan River back then. They were looking for John. They might have seen a crowd. And when they went there, they were a sinner in search of something. But when they left that Jordan River, they should have been transformed. They should have had a new identity. They would have abandoned their former self. This is why Jesus didn't really need to get baptized. This is why John was puzzled when Jesus showed up. Jesus didn't need a new identity. He didn't need to turn away from sin. He was the second Adam. He was flawless, sinless, pure, the holy manifestation of God in the flesh. So if we consider the act of baptism for all those people, they needed something cleansed. Jesus didn't. Now, were those people saved in the act of baptism? Were we saved in our act of baptism? Well, I think it was a milestone for us, but I think that it was only the act of Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross that saved us. That was the milestone for us of saving. That was when we were crucified with Christ, as Paul wrote in Galatians. It is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Baptism was a moment to acknowledge where we abandon our former lives. And we can do that every day. We can do that now. When we examine the baptism of Jesus Christ, it presents us an opportunity to think about our commitment to that new identity. If it wasn't us that came up from the water, so to speak, and it was Christ in us, how should we then lead our lives? If this was a turning point in our life timeline, a milestone, did it change us? Now, unfortunately, we can't just proclaim ourselves as Christians and walk away from sin and be perfect. That would be pretty nice now, wouldn't it? No, we're still plagued by all kinds of temptations and failures, missed opportunities, the list goes on. But we did have that moment where we turned away from sin and towards Christ. And as we talked about with the little children, a ship or a plane navigating needs those course corrections. We can't just have a milestone where we point ourselves to Christ and spend years thereafter not looking at our destination. We need frequent, sometimes continuous course correction. We need to be committed to Christ. We need to reflect on how committed we are to him, how much we pray, how often and how thoroughly we search the scriptures, and how often we listen for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We must be watchful for God pushing in our lives searching for his divine will for each of us. Let's think about this identity part once more. We've committed to abandon our former sinful nature and pursue a life devoted to Christ. Can you say, it is not I who lives, but Christ in me? (coughs) To live is Christ and to die is gain. These are some things that we can find in the Bible. They kind of have this feeling that we should be all in. This is a great opportunity to rule out a bunch of distraction in our lives. You know, around us, this world has this uh, obsession with identity. People want to identify as things now. People want to be something. They want to be special. Now, as a Christian, we, uh, we each get a little shortcut to get out of all this confusion. We have a very simple answer. We are simply Christians. We've abandoned all that is not Christ. That sums it all up. No other identity is necessary. God doesn't want us to be Christian as one element on a list of five or ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one. Now, getting back to why Jesus was baptized, one of the things that answers that is hidden right in that scripture. John the Baptist answered the question. He shouted, Behold! the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Now that's quite a title. You think of God, the creator of the universe, incarnate in the flesh, 
and he picks the symbol of a lamb. And not just any lamb, he's the Passover lamb. You know, if we fast forward a few years in Jesus' earthly walk, he comes as a lamb just before Passover. And just as lambs were in the home of a Jewish family for three days before they were sacrificed, that three days was so they could be inspected to make sure they were blameless or perfect. Jesus was in Jerusalem for three days before he was sacrificed. That's the part of the scripture that saves us, not our baptism. Now, just as Jesus emerged from that baptism and had the Spirit descend upon him like a dove and had the voice of the Father declare from heaven that it is his holy beloved Son, immediately thereafter, Jesus was driven by the Spirit. He was driven to be tempted. That's kind of the state of life where we find ourselves, isn't it? We've got the Spirit. It's descended upon us. It's there. We can pray for more. But we're still tempted. We're still frail. We're still fragile. In contemplating our experience with turning away from sin, dealing with that temptation, and struggling with this new identity of being and living a Christian life, Listen to the words of a poem that I found. Uh, this is inscribed within a cathedral in Lübeck, Germany. So speaks Christ our Lord to us. You call me master, yet you do not obey me. You call me light, and yet you do not see me. You call me the way, and yet you do not walk. You call me the life, and yet you do not desire me. You call me wise, and yet you do not follow me. You call me fair, and yet you do not love me. You call me rich, and you, you, yet you do not ask me. You call me eternal, and yet you do not seek me. You call me gracious, and do not trust me. You call me noble, and do not serve me. You call me mighty, and do not honor me. You call me just, and do not fear me. So if I condemn you, blame me not. Now, I don't want to stray into a works-based Christianity. We know that we are saved, and we are saved by faith and by grace. But to be clear, it doesn't matter how much we try, we're going to fall short. You know, John Wesley, as part of our Methodist heritage, we know that John Wesley, he ardently tried to pursue a holiness, a sinless life, perhaps to a fault. It's a noble cause, but it just can't can't be done. There was only one who was sinless. But we can learn quite a bit, just as he did, from self-inspection of our souls. It's critical to measuring if we're on track. Just as that ship or plane, or you know, even if you're driving a car, you can't make it there without course correction, recommitting to that new identity of Christ, and putting our faith in God to plant ourselves firmly in his word and to walk by faith. Now, there were some warnings before Jesus showed up. Did you catch those in the scripture? So many people from Judea were going to see John to be baptized that there were great crowds. Undoubtedly, the Pharisees and Sadducees went more to see what was happening than because they had any interest in repentance. John immediately recognized that, and he called them out. These people had no interest or perhaps very little in changing their identities. He called them a brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God's, God can raise up children for Abraham. John knew they weren't afraid of coming wrath. They thought they were above all that. They were righteous already. They saw themselves as blameless. This reminds me of Luke chapter 18, where that tax collector and the Pharisee alike are praying. The tax collector beats his breast and asks God, Be merciful to me, Lord, a sinner. And then Jesus tells us what the Pharisee says. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Jesus declared, One of these men walked away justified rather than the other. For he who humbles himself will be exalted, and those who justify themselves will be humbled. These Pharisees and Sadducees, 
They felt they could justify themselves rather than humble themselves. They had a lineage. Their identity was in their ancestry to Abraham. They had no desire for a new one. They were quite pleased with themselves. That's one of those dangerous things, isn't it, to be pleased with yourself? Are any of you out there comfortable with your own identities? I think sometimes it's easy to drift into comfort to the question, who am I? If you have an answer to that that's sufficient to give you a little peace, security, maybe even confidence, we can just rest there, can't we? But then, are we really producing any fruit worthy of repentance? You know, you look in the scriptures, even, even some of the authors of books of the New Testament, they wrote of their need to self-examine. James wrote, we all stumble in many ways. And Paul wrote several times, but in particular in Romans chapter 7, for the good that I want to do, I cannot. And the evil which I know I shouldn't do, that I practice. So if even Paul and James had personal relationships with Jesus and were so inspired by the Spirit as they were, had to seek repentance and had to self-reflect like this, I don't think we should believe that we are above that. Now think back to uh, some of those warnings that John had for the Pharisees. The axe lies ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, it's no wonder, really, that John wasn't popular with this crowd. This is about a year before he's imprisoned and eventually killed. When you speak truth to people in power, there are consequences. But nevertheless, that warning that he gave to them, it mostly fell on deaf deaf ears. There may have been a few Pharisees that uh, turned. We know that Nicodemus and Paul and Joseph of Arimathea They ended up serving the gospel before the end. The warning worked for them, and it can serve us as well. Every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The wheat will be separated from the chaff. You see, a good tree produces good fruit, fruit worthy of repentance. What is your fruit? Remember, if you are a Christian, you have been bought with a price, a steep price. The Lamb of God was sacrificed. God redeemed every one of us with the blood of his Son, and we are no longer our own. Yes, we relinquished some of our desires, some of the things that we wanted to see, but we've also relinquished a lot of baggage. You can trust that God has a divinely inspired and ordained special plan for you. Wouldn't you rather trust that than your own judgment? To trust that he who created the world, the heavens and the earth, knows better than you. And that he will give you a full, blessed, and meaningful life. So this identity crisis that the world has isn't really relevant for us as Christians, as believers. See, when we had the milestone of baptism, or the milestone of conversion, whatever it was for you, you were grafted into a unique place. A royal priesthood, as Peter called it. You were part of a people of God's unique possession. You were a son or a daughter of Christ. If we doubt our self-worth, if someone says to us, you're not good enough, whether you say it or not, you can believe in your heart. I don't care what you think. Because God, he sees it otherwise. He died died for you, to purchase you. And it all began with baptism. In Acts chapter 10, Peter proclaimed Jesus for who he was. He reminded us that when John baptized him and John called him, then the Spirit echoed it by anointing him, coming down as a dove. And then the words of the Father proclaimed it too. The Spirit came upon him and said, This is Christ. This is the Savior of all man. And when we come up out of the water, so to speak, we take part in that. The Spirit can descend just upon, upon us, and we can have that happen, not just once when we're baptized, but every day when we recommit and when we pray to it. So recommit to that identity daily. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then walk as Jesus did. Overcome temptation. Do good. Heal. And be with those who are oppressed. As was written in Acts chapter 10, Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God 
to judge the living and the dead. All the prophets testified to him, the Spirit testified to him, the Father testified to him, and we can testify to him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness through the sins of Jesus' name, through the forgiveness of sins through Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, at this time, we'll continue our worship with the presentation of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. For anyone who's worshiping on the radio or at home or on Facebook or wherever you find yourselves, if you send any offerings into the church, they will be included with this. We submit to you a portion of the many blessings that you have given each of us. Please help these gifts to honor you and to work in your service. May your spirit bless those who receive them, those who gave them, and may you be glorified through them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today can be found in the Red Hymnal, 
When Jesus Came to Jordan, page 252. Come, Holy Spirit, aid us to keep the vows we make. I'll leave you with the words from Ephesians chapter 3. I ask that out of the riches of his glory, may he strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then you, being rooted and grounded in love, will have power, together with all the saints, to comprehend the length and which, width and height and depth of the love of Christ, to know that this love surpasses all knowledge, and you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.